You are listening to the Ghost Furnace Podcast. If you have a paranormal experience of your own that you would like to share, please email it to us at theghostfurnacepodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please rate, subscribe, and review on whichever platform you use. Also, like and share us on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Okay, so today I have what I think is a pretty interesting story, and it's going to take us back to the 1940s. It's also going to take us to northeastern Ohio, Summit County in particular. Those of you not familiar with Ohio and its number of counties, that is just south of Cleveland and really not too far from us here at the Ghost First Podcast, probably about a good hour and a half drive away. I'm actually pretty familiar. This area I'm going to be speaking of is now part of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, which has uh, some controversy of its own I might touch upon here in a minute. So I want to talk about the Peninsula Python. So going back to late spring of 1944, June 8th of 1944 to be exact, a farmer, Clarence Mitchell, sees a large snake out in his cornfield, and his dogs, the story goes, are pretty adamant that they're not going to have anything to do with it right now. Clarence, judging the distance of the snake, uh, looked and, you know, he had the rows of corn to go by, approximated the size to be between 15 and 18 feet. He kept his distance and the snake went down to the river, but continued sightings of the snake or the snake tracks continued on throughout the remainder of the summer of 1944. I believe from everything I dug up that the sightings concluded on August 1st, and around that time, people are starting to look towards autumn and the cold lake effect winters that come with living in northeastern Ohio, being as it is pretty close to you know, Lake Erie. Now, people began assuming that, you know, this is clearly almost certainly not a native snake, because while we do have some rather big snakes here, 15 to 18 feet is pretty outside the norm and the sightings of the tracks claim that the snake tracks were as wide as an automobile tire <clears throat> the assumption was that because of its size the snake certainly couldn't be native it's my belief that the understanding is that the winter months kind of keep a snake's growth in check and that a snake that large would have to be native to a climate that it's, you know, considerably warmer year round. So the story actually was printed in issue 176, that's November 1945 issue of the Atlantic Monthly. I did try to obtain a copy of that article, but as of yet, I've not had any luck. So if anybody has access to that article, if they could check that. Uh, My knowledge of it being printed in the Atlantic comes actually from going through old newspapers from northeastern Ohio in the 1970s, actually. So, again, it's first seen June 8th, 1944, and the last sighting that I could confirm in that first summer was August 1st, so I believe it was uh, seen in a woman's hen house. Okay, but then sightings of it do kind of pop up now and then. Now, how long do snakes live? It's my understanding that not super long. They're not like parrots or tortoises. And so the sightings today couldn't possibly be the same snake. But more interesting to me are the stories as to how the snake came to be. The prevailing story, again, for which I couldn't find any evidence, is that some snakes had escaped from a circus truck. Back in the day, circuses would exhibit snakes and whatnot. I mean, snakes are always 
a hot item. Like when I go to the zoo, I know I'm always in the snake room. I like checking it out. Second only to the big aquarium. Uh, I really, yeah, I guess anything behind glass I feel good about, especially anything dangerous like snakes, like spiders, um, like fish. I, I live in mortal fear of, of fish jumping out from behind a bush and attacking me. So I, I can't find any evidence of that snakes getting away from the circus, although not unprecedented, these sort of things happen. But the stories go that the snakes got out. Most of them were recaptured, but that one python was not accounted for. And yeah, 15 to 18 feet is a good sized python. Of what type, I don't know. It doesn't go into that. So anyhow... There is a more recent story as to how the snake came to be because people, as I say, claim to still, on occasion, spot the snake living in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Now, I said the National Park is a little controversial. In fact, the park itself was only established around 2000, and a number of families were you know, displaced, picked up by eminent domain, I know a lot of them weren't very happy about it. Here's another interesting thing. In the mid-1940s, the Kriji family uh, had a municipal dump. It was originally just scrap metal, but into the 50s and 60s, a lot of businesses, including 3M, including Ford Motor Company and Chrysler, were dumping chemicals, dioxins, and whatnot, uh, arsenic and such, into this site, the Kregi Dump Site, which covers about 47 acres. Now, this would, the site would close in 80, 1980. It would kind of continue operating for scrap until 86. It actually became a Superfund site. Now, a Superfund is uh, the quickest definition I can give. If you're familiar with uh, very famous Superfund sites such as Love Canal or Times Beach. These are environmental cleanup sites. And 47 acres of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park was deemed a Superfund site, I think, less than a decade ago. As of two months ago, coincidentally, I saw a report that it is in, in local news that it is entirely cleaned up now. They've replanted native grasses, they're restoring, they've restored the wetlands to the area. And why is this important? Well, because now one of the startup theories is that how this snake of unusual size came to the area was that it had mutated because of all these chemicals in the Superfund site, which I think is a very comic book understanding of how mutations work they usually don't work to the benefit of a thing um i mean how many how many of those radium ladies in new jersey back in the day how many of them developed superpowers not many how many of them shot up eight feet tall uh none that i am familiar with but again the snake from the 40s is certainly deceased was it there because of an accident where snakes escaped from a circus again that seems possible honestly uh, that a large snake could have escaped and was kind of roaming around northeastern ohio but the continued sightings well into the 70s and everything kind of i don't buy it and of course, we have a history of a big snake here, so we, by golly, are going to keep a history of a big snake here. So, of course, there's a super fun site with all these chemicals and everything so that made a snake get superpowers and grow very big, and that's why we have large snake. Now, there is actually, in the town of Peninsula, they do have a parade. Who doesn't like that? I'm into it, especially because that's a sort of nonsense like our uh, Groundhog's Day here in central Pennsylvania. I really like that. Uh, I, I want a parade that's just madness. It's just a silly uh, thing like that. And you know what? If it's a celebration of a giant snake that once terrorized the town for the summer, I'm all about it. 
So, as always, I'm curious as to what the two of you think. Do you think this is some sort of mythical snake cryptid that's terrorizing, kind of terrorizing northeastern Ohio? Do you think that this is the story of what we see quite a lot in folklore, where there was a real event, possibly, just not well documented, but a totally plausible event that then can to grow legs as snakes do and here we have the peninsula python as we know it today well let's just jump right into it if that's all right so i am curious what do you guys think one do you think it's entirely probable uh, the way i see it there are two probable scenarios, three probable scenarios. Either someone made up a tall tale and the town went with it, a person in the 40s had an exotic pet that escaped or that they intentionally let loose, uh, or three, a snake escaped from the circus. I suppose, I suppose, we can't rule out a fourth that there just was a snake of unusual size. But do you think it really happened in one of those three it happened scenarios? Or do you think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'll shut up. I'll go first, Brennan, real quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I, what I did was I separated my two theories into skeptical and fantastical. So I'm going to go with a skeptical one to start to get the there conversation go. like going. So, you know, first what I came up with was, I mean, this was obviously a large snake for the region. But I went and looked, I was looking online and I found that there was actually a python at the Pittsburgh Zoo from 1949 until 1963 named Colossus that was said to be at least 30 feet long in its final years. But it was also received from an animal dealer that, which was in Singapore. So that kind of gives weight to your what they were saying about the possibility that it came off of a was it escape from the circus or something? Right. Um, but, you know, from what we know about snakes around the world, it's not necessarily unheard of. So it, that's kind of my skeptical uh, approach to it. Yeah, I guess it was just it's it's very uncommon to have a snake native to our region. And of course, this is just across the border from us in northeastern Ohio to have a snake within our region be that large. I know some of our uh, black snakes, rat snakes. Uh, can get pretty large, but I think they kind of, they're around the nine foot is about the largest. Right. Uh, I could be wrong on that. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's definitely plausible that, especially a python. What do you think, Brendan? So, uh, I thought this was a pretty, pretty fun little story. Uh, I really liked it because it, it reminded me of a few different things and in a few different directions, kind of like you were saying, Mike. To answer your question directly, Nick, I think it probably did happen. There probably was a large stake in the area given uh, the number of reports and the time frame. Now, as far as where it came from, that's a little harder to pin down, obviously. I think the Occam's razor answer would be that it was probably a exotic pet that someone had, because you have to think about it. I mean, especially back then, there was a lot of oil money in the area and the odds of someone a little more eccentric having a menagerie uh, would not be that out of the question so probably an escaped like reticulated python or something like that because i mean those things can you know get up to you know people say you know 20 30 feet sometimes as far as like the climate like you brought up nick yeah there's i the uh, the odds of it being native are low i think i am always constantly surprised when i hear about how certain reptiles and amphibians uh can hibernate and survive in cooler temperatures like every time i think i know the limit of that i hear about some frog that basically freezes itself and then unfreezes itself or something like that so i, I think i think that keeps it within the realm of possibility that yeah it could have lived you know 30 40 years or something like that uh, i'd love to hear from an actual herpetologist on that if anyone out there is listening um, as far yeah, as the length of years, I, I think that uh, from what I, I did do a little bit of additional research, I think snakes in captivity, I think it, it's 20 years for a large snake is mm -hmm. about the ballpark that 
that's the figure I kept coming to. So I figured in the wild it'd be somewhat less. You'd think, yeah. No, that seems reasonable. That seems that seems totally reasonable. Now you brought up the idea of it. Um... Was this my two, then three, then okay? I guess four. Yeah, possibly. the problem is the problem is I should I should have I should have written them down. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them real quick. Yeah, go through them again. The real, I see real quick. it. Yeah. The the first possibility, it's made up. Okay. That's it. Made up. Someone made it up. Told a yarn. People went with it. Two, it was an unusually large native. Okay. Native. Because, uh, you know, there's anomalies all the time. We've talked about this before. Uh, number three, it was an exotic pet. Okay. And then number four, this is not necessarily the order I, I brought them yeah. up. Number four is it was the carnival or some other thing like it that was transporting large snakes, maybe just a zoo transport, and some snakes escaped. I did try to go through a lot of the local regional media newspapers and whatnot, um, but I was not able to find anything such as, hey, in rural you know, Ohio kind of suburban mm -hmm. Ohio. It was, like, it was still rural, pretty rural back in the 40s. Uh, large snake escaped. We haven't caught them all. So, mm -hmm. okay, so it's either made up, that's yeah. the exclusionary option, or it happened, and there's three options under that. It was an unusually large yeah. native species. It was an exotic animal that someone had that escaped, mm -hmm. or it was a snake that was being transported and then escaped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, I've already answered two of those, so I'm going to answer the, the last two, and then I actually have a wild card number three for you that I want, I want your guys' your guys's thoughts on. Um, I've got a so, wild card to throw in there, too. Oh, excellent. Good. We got <laughs> wild card. <laughs> yep. Um, we need to have a sound effect for that. Like, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but you said about, about, about it being a natural, a natural uh, snake that just, you know, uh, was it, I mean, we have a lot of different, we have a surprising amount of snakes in the area, but you're right. Like rat snakes, king snakes, those are about the longest ones you're going to see. I've seen a few rat and king snakes, maybe some racers that were pushing six, six foot. And those looked huge. Like when you actually see them up close, you're like, that's a, that's a big snake. You know, the like, let's assume that this farmer was was over exaggerating by half even a 15 foot long naturally occurring snake in this region would be incredibly anomalous not to say it theoretically couldn't happen uh, because like we've said before when we were talking about uh a story we had a few weeks ago about the uh the large bird things can happen uh there is gigantism gigantism that does happen in certain animals and um i can't remember the condition that like certain catfish have and other animals, which is basically like as long as they have a food supply, they get, they kind of keep growing. Like they genetically don't actually top. There's not like a top end. Basically, if they can stay alive and keep eating, they kind of keep growing. That's where you see catfish that are you know, 500 pounds and you know 10 feet long. Um, it's not because they're supposed to be that big. It's just because they can because of all the food they have access to. So arguably, a large snake around here has access to tons of food. So if that's something that certain snakes are able to do, again, that's something for a herpetologist to answer to say if that's even possible, but it's something to least entertain, you know? One thing, and I'm not trying yeah. to correct you on anything, but Please I think do. queen snake, not king snake. We have queen snakes. We do not have king snakes. Really? So, the, so, yeah, the, so the king snakes are more of a Western or Southern thing. Really? Okay. See? Yeah. And a queen snake can get, uh, up to two feet okay so those ones are smaller okay i think i think anytime i see like a rat or a racer or anything like that they're all i know there's differences depending on like the kind of white they have on the underbelly yeah. and stuff one's like but, a more greenish but yeah I think yeah racer has a more greenish belly yeah and we'll have to racer is like a sleek black yeah it's hard to tell the difference between that and one of our black rat snakes exactly yeah because rat snakes can get pretty big too you know what we should have flashcards for these next time that's um, a great idea that's yeah um I have access to a laminator now, so that's something we're going to have to look into. But uh, so the last two things I wanted to I wanted to talk about, basically those are the three options uh, as far as it being real and it actually happening. 
I think it probably falls under those categories. But one of the things I wanted to bring up to you guys is what about if it the person did see this large snake and what if there actually was a paranormal element to it? Because you don't hear about uh, snakes being seen as like spiritual creatures in encounters like we like like you would a bigfoot or a thunderbird or a ghost or something like that but when you think about the vestigial nature of our fear with snakes like there's the whole theory that um and i'm probably butchering this from an anthropological standpoint but i think i remember hearing once that the reason there's uh a lot of cultures across the world have a dragon archetype is because it combines birds, snakes, and lions, which was basically like our three main predators whenever we were still like living in trees, basically. Like snakes have been dangerous for a long time. When you think of, you know, even like religiously, the snake in the Garden of Eden, you have snakes uh, associated with many different deities over, over, the, over, the, over the years and through different cultures. So who's to say that you couldn't see a apparition of a snake? That's my wild card. Want to see what you guys think about that? I mean, yeah, for sure. That's definitely something, you know, in our heads that snakes are bad, I guess is a simple way to say it. I know, like you mentioned, like with the, the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of creation, my grandma, like, hated snakes. I remember when I got a, I got a pet snake or I caught a snake and put it in a tank mm-hmm. and she was so mad that i have really oh yeah oh, that's funny yeah like, she was like just because of just it. what it was like just like that just that what it represents so yeah. yeah 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 oh that's wild that's wild you know it's interesting because i mean you might go somewhere else and i'm sure there are cultures out there that where snakes were revered you know as uh as a as a positive omen not as a, a negative manifestation or something well, i would say even in uh even in some of the Southern Baptist tradition, there's the snake handlers. Oh, right, right. Interpretation of a, are they really viewing the snakes as evil or is it because it, they're they're walking a weird walk where there is a definite snake iconography mm-hmm. and being able to handle them is viewed as a positive thing. Even though the snakes are still maligned, in order for them to handle them as regularly as they do, they also have to care for them. Mm-hmm. Puts them in a weird place, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it's true. No, but, no, but I think it's interesting that we're bringing this up, though, just because, like, again, whenever you have an anomalous sighting like this, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of questions. And obviously some of them, I think, we could all agree are more uh, rational and more more based in likelihood than others. But who's to say? I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I would like to talk to the farmer more. I'd like to, like to, I'd like to have interviewed that farmer. Huh. And maybe press them a little bit on finding out if there was another weird stuff going on at the same time. You know, like was it was it just the large snake or, right. you know, did like is even then like did he lose any cattle to it? I don't know. I just I, I think it's interesting. And one of the one of the last things I wanted to bring up about this real quick, and uh, we may have a have to revisit this on a future episode. Um, I couldn't find the shoemaker story about the long snake that the loggers were sitting on. Do you remember that story, Nick? I don't think that came from Shoemaker, who was, uh, for those of you who don't know, Henry W. Shoemaker was the first state folklorist of Pennsylvania. It was a kind of a title almost created by him in the 1930s. And if you go around Pennsylvania, you see all our historic markers, they're blue. To this day, even though he, he died in the mid-50s, I want to say, to this day, most of those were written by him. There is mm-hmm. some very questionable history on many uh, of his stories as well. But I think that story came from James York uh, Glim. Oh, was that a Glim story? Okay, that explains teacher. that explains why I couldn't fi- find it in Rich because I thought it was in there. Okay, okay, but but I mean, like this. But what I, what I was the reason I was looking that up was because there are there is there is at least a history from a folklore standpoint of abnormally large snakes being sighted in Pennsylvania. I mean, which isn't far from Northeast Ohio, obviously. And I wouldn't be shocked if every state had a few of those folklore stories. For sure. And this isn't even us getting into hoop snakes. We could have a whole episode on hoop snakes. Well, you know, a theory that I find interesting 
And, um, you know, Brandon, I'm, I think you probably heard of it, Nick. I'm not sure if you have, but I'll explain it all. Um, it's the, uh, the Talpa effect. Okay, so a Talpa is a thought form or being created via collective or separate thoughts. So like basically a good example of a, a Talpa would be like the Slender Man phenomenon. After that event occur, occurred with the Slender Man and he became like this big internet sensation, people actually started seeing him like as, as a paranormal experience. And the, the theory is that you know, basically the, the collective uh, of people, you know, thinking about this being, it kind of brought it into existence and manifested it. Well, you know, to go off that, that's a pretty interesting thing. And I think there's something to it because one of the things that I had speculated, I guess when I did this whole story, I walked away and I've been thinking about it. And my conclusion was that something happened. Somebody saw a large snake, quite possibly escaped. I buy all of this likely died over the winter, but it becomes a myth. It becomes something people almost want to be a part of and want to see. And that collective thing makes it real. And this gets into kind of a linguistic place with like uh, the Aristotelian thinking, which is that language creates reality in a way. And so uh, I, I always like to bring up the example of, you know, uh, tomatoes, for hundreds of years, they were poisonous because they were thought to be poisonous. And people uh, constructed their reality to that tomatoes are poisonous and lived according to that reality. The fact that tomatoes weren't poisonous, you know, doesn't come into effect until later. And then reality shifts. So in that way, language does create our reality. And for those of you wondering why, it's not some people say, well, it's because of red and that's a dangerous color. Well, nonsense. Most meats are red. Strawberries are red. Uh, plenty of things we eat are red. The tomatoes are in the nightshade family. Mm -hmm. And if you know about nightshade, you know it's, it can be some pretty caustic stuff to ingest. So it's, it's not a silly thing. So it does make me think like your Slender Man example, I think is a really good example of that, Mike, because here we have stories being created on the internet and it gets an inertia and people start propelling it because it's an engaging idea. Not unlike Spider-Man is an engaging idea that can propel itself. We see this anytime there is a good story. Uh, there's the modern concept of fan fiction right now in a way when we create mythology by retelling stories, we are essentially creating an oral fan fiction, you could say. So I think your Slender Man example is a really interesting one. And there are certainly people who believe in it because language in a way does create our realities. And uh, I find myself philosophically split between that way of constructing reality as well as the phenomenological way, which is that our own personal experiences. You can say revelation if you want to get fantastical about it, also creates our reality. Yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, I agree. Yeah, there we go. We, we, we uh, fixed it. Um, let's see. I have a lot of thoughts on that. So uh, first with Mike, you mentioned the Talpa and everything. That's something that, uh, again, kind of stems from I believe Buddhist mm -hmm. philosophy. I could be wrong on that, uh, but it's one. It's one of the major Eastern traditions. From what I understand, with it, I think that that whatever mechanic they're getting to talking about these things, I think exp I think can explain a lot of the the how and why of a lot of paranormal activity. Um, the Slender Man is a great example. The another one that's a little more, I think, grounded grounded in reality, which almost gets into the into the realm of like living memes, is do you guys remember the uh, the clown scare back in was it 2014, 2015? Oh yeah, yeah, not like, that long ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was basically one of the. So for those of you who aren't familiar, it was basically made up that there were these like killer clowns just showing up random places all over the country. Then people started reenacting basically viral videos of like staged events kind of thing but then <laughs> like the like the third level to the, the third kick in this inception is uh then you suddenly have random people being attacked in legitimate legitimate instances or being chased by clowns and having like the police called and everything so 
or Whether people or pulling not, guns on people who yeah, are dressed as clowns. Exactly. Yeah. I remember seeing videos of that too. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's one of those things where it gets back to what Dick was saying about reality being created with words. Reality is an agreement that we're all kind yeah. of coming in and out of at all times, which is a terrifying thing to have to live with. But it's one of the best ways to explain how we how we view a lot of these things. And if you like Nick said, if you have enough people who are thinking about something as being real, almost what is the difference between it everyone believing it's real and whether whether or not it is real or not? Like it goes back to if we change the if we say my blue shirt is yellow and we flip flop yeah. the words for blue and yellow has reality been changed in any real meaningful way it's but i also want to say Correct. in a real and meaningful way the fear of clowns is entirely justified thanks to john wayne gacy if nobody absolutely else. oh totally yeah no and, and and it's one of those things where that plays on a lot of people's innate fears with clowns whether legitimate or or imagined. there were also a few movies back in the 90s that the help oh with yeah, that too. Oh, absolutely. From outer space. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, but I think, but getting to the whole words thing, Nick. I mean, we're. I, I know we're we're a few shades removed now from from a, a farmer seeing a snake, but but I think that's a really important thing that we need to talk about because words in general, I think, historically proven have power, and I mean that in the very realistic literal sense. Like I'm not being figurative when I say they have power, whether it is something that's a little easier to, to, un to understand and track, like how certain quotes can inspire people, uh, how certain words and how certain words or phrases on their own are just sometimes beautiful. I'll, yes. I'll just insert a quick thing. Mm -hmm. I, I gave a lecture once at, at a workshop a few years ago where I talked about the need to be very you know, aware of words we choose because words have real power. Mm -hmm. As long as words have real power, you need to learn how to utilize that power. And I said, you know, um, cult leader Jonestown, Jim Jones, mm -hmm. I brought him up in his example. And I said, listen, Jim Jones got people to kill themselves using very little more than words. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a positive thing, but it's something you need to respect. And it is a demonstration. That Absolutely. words do carry power. Absolutely, and and I think that that goes back to the you know some of the more, some of the other side of things we talk about when it comes to religion. You know, religion has rituals and spells and mantras and uh, prayers. You know, I think most people have words in their lives or you know things that they say that they would agree hold hold very real power. And I think that's something that has to be taken into account when looking at like the paranormal side of the world, looking at the other, looking at uh, things that we are just questioning in general. How do the words, how does the folklore, how does the passage of these, of these stories affect both not only the stories themselves, but the reality around them? Yeah, basically what I was getting at with, with the whole Talpa thing, the, the collective storytelling and lore in the region, in theory, could manifest something as mundane, too, as a, just a python and not something that's extremely creepy. Like Nick had mentioned that the, uh, you know, the, the first account could have been very real. You know, the thing, the python dies off in the wintertime, but then it's in people's heads that, that this is out there and they're seeing it. And even if they maybe just saw a snake, they might just be overreacting to it. <laughs> I think all oh, those are well, giants. Thing. No, no, you're absolutely right. Because think of, um, I'm sure I don't know if you guys saw just a few months ago on this is very regional, but on Facebook, uh, someone posted a picture of a huge, quote unquote, huge snake in Frick Park down in Pittsburgh. I didn't see, and that. it was it was all over the place for like a week, and it was on the news and all kinds of stuff. You know, you have a lot of people out there who you know just kind of share stuff obviously without really looking at it or doing much research through, through very easy, through very uh, simple photo analysis. You could tell that a, it was just a rat snake and B it was like four feet long. Like huh. it wasn't, it was not, it was, I mean, not a small snake by not especially. even big by rat snake size. Yeah. Yeah. That's our uh, largest snake in this area is my understanding. Yeah. And, um, but the reason that stuff can also be dangerous is because then you have a whole bunch of people who hate snakes going to Frick Park 
trying to trying to find a, a big snake to kill kind of thing. Um, but they're right. pitchforks. Yeah, yeah, basically, no, basically that that's, that that kind of stuff happens, and that kind of goes. To, that, I think that's a good intersection between what you were saying, Mike, about people blowing these out of proportion and the power of words that you mentioned, Nick, and how when those things come together, they can create really, re again, the, the very a very real scenario that came out of just a misinterpretation and a few words. Right. So you know the interesting takeaway, you know, for me in all this, and, I, and I'm assuming knowing Nick well enough that this is what he was, the what, the point that he was getting to, and you know the whole reason for it being on the Ghost Furnace podcast is it comes down to the lore that is created when a story like this is spread throughout a region. So this is where I'm going to transition into the next part of the part of our discussion here. Cool. So this is the wild card. That was the wild card was the Tulpa effect. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's make sure. <laughs> we, we need the sound effect. This, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to, if we'll, you we'll get that here. in post, post production. <laughs> Nick and Brendan know that our, our first recording of the Ghost Furnace podcast that never actually made it to air. So this is something we actually talked about in our in our first recording, and this has to do with lore being created and something a lot of our listeners might not realize is that we were actually part of a, a local lore that was um, created at our, at our college uh, in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, this one was very wild to me because the very short story is that basically Mike and Brendan and our friend Greg had moved into a place that very day. And I, th I think it was the three of us had a show down in Elwood City, mm -hmm. and so we didn't come back till late. I wasn't yet living there, uh, and our friend Greg got back home first and found that the handyman had died in his closet fixing the hot water tank, and so there were some insensitive jokes that we would make through the course of our living there, like we threatened to bring the count up. I had actually, my friend Iki and I had found a box <laughs> six, so I would say, and so I would say this is number two for me. Um, you know, that, yeah, I saw it, right. So long story short, I'm in a car with a coworker about 15 years later, and we happen to be driving by our old apartment, uh, I'm in social service at this point, and she looks and she goes, oh, you see those apartments there? I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, supposedly they're haunted because some guy died in them. And I said, oh, yeah, his name was this. Um, he died in my friend Greg's closet in the day we moved in. And she just stared at me for a while. And I said, yeah, we used to threaten to bring the count up to two. Uh, Greg crocheted a little cross because he started feeling guilty about joking about it all the time. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, so that's real. There are ghost stories told about our old apartment. So we are very much at the epicenter of a story. And this is something we've talked about amongst us a lot. And I think that initial recording didn't air because I know I was pretty harsh on 1980s era, um, Chrysler vehicles. Chrysler, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't want to lose potential Chrysler endorsement money. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think, but uh, sorry, uh, Mike, did you have anything else to add to that before I get? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was about to say, and I think that, um, like, that was a that was a surprisingly concise telling of that story, Nick. Uh, a plus, the shortest story I'll ever tell. And, yeah, I was gonna I, say I, he's got it down like, to science now. Yeah, like <laughs> ordering food takes longer than that. Um, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, no, but you're absolutely right, Mike. That like. This is a great example of how the kind of like impetus of something, once it's planted, then kind of grows. And very quickly, it is beyond your control if you're, if you're, there, in, if you're there in the beginning. So like if, if you're this guy who uh, saw that snake initially, he might have just reported a big snake. And then all of a sudden, we're here 80 years later still talking about this damn big snake that this guy saw. You know, that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, even that guy would probably be like, it wasn't that big. It wasn't that big. To keep talking about it, guys. Yeah. He's like, you could have yeah. talked about all the hard work I did on my farm. You're yeah. still talking about a snake I saw. <laughs> it's like, sorry, man, if that's, if that's the most noteworthy thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, no, but yeah, but it's 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 interesting because like you think about up at Slippery Rock, how many ghost stories we all heard about how many places in the three to five years we were all up there how many of those started in similar ways to that story 
and I asked <laughs> I asked one of my cousins about about uh, the apartment complex that uh, that we're that we're speaking of, and he's like, "Oh yeah, they're haunted." I think that the idea of like not being able to like once you ring that bell, it's it's out there is the cause of a lot of folklore. But I think that the cool thing about that is there's typically a seed of truth in the beginning of something. I think very rarely does folklore come out of uh, just completely fabricated instances. Now it can. Um, th- we may we, we may not want to get into this for spoilers or if you guys haven't seen it. But is it if, did you guys watch the uh, that recent uh, Sasquatch documentary on Hulu? What, what was it called? Was it just called Search for Sasquatch? It was called like it was just called Sasquatch. Yeah, I think not so. the best title, maybe. Like, <laughs> yeah, not the best title, especially since like it was it very it very much was not about Sasquatch. It was like a true crime kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I thought it was elite. I thought it was. I thought it was entertaining. Most people that went into it thinking it was going to be a Sasquatch documentary were sorely. Well, that's a letdown because you're not because it didn't yeah. end up with Sasquatch. But that, but that being said, I thought one of the true crime. What has he been up to? Well, it's yeah, it's a whole. I don't. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get into the story or anything necessarily. One of the things that it brought up that isn't talked about much, especially in the cryptid community, that I think you're kind of hitting on here, Mike, is the idea that folklore can be created for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's just purely for gossip. Other times, from a cultural standpoint, it's to teach a lesson. Sometimes it is to uh, to warn of a legitimate danger. It may be an amalgamation or a fictionalized, fictionalized version of, of the danger, but still it says, don't go into the woods. I think pretty much every culture has some, has some story of like, don't follow the lights into the woods at night. If you see lights in the woods, you don't follow them. You know? well, I think of the classic Cook story. The lovers are out oh, yeah. in the car. Yeah. They hear about the escaped convict. It's the hook. Well, it's clearly a morality tale warning uh, youthful, lusty young yeah. people not to go out. And uh, and actually, you should talk about the whole cloth thing. I mean, I think Mike brought, Mike brought up a really good example earlier, the Slender Man stuff. We know exactly the origins of those stories as, as far as print goes. So right. yeah, we, we have examples. Absolutely. And I think that uh, this, this documentary, one of the things it brings up is basically people were saying, oh, there's Sasquatch in this area to keep people away. Whether or not there actually are Sasquatch in that area is kind of secondary to the fact that people were actively saying there's Sasquatch in an area specifically to keep people out of it. And you hear a lot when people say, oh, why would someone make up this story? You know, whenever you hear stories from people. Now, I think there's a, a difference you have to, I think there's a, you have to kind of parse that out because whenever we talk about an individual's story mm-hmm. and why someone would make something up, I think that's very different than like what we're talking about here about someone, you know, making something up to keep people away. That's a conscious decision to get a desired effect. I think that most people who are telling stories, if they, if we want to be cynical and say some people feel like they get a little bit of attention out of it, maybe that's something that has to be taken into account. But I think that that is a, that's rare because whenever you hear stories, especially with cryptids, with cryptid sightings and a lot of UFO sightings, especially if they're a little more involved, people generally sound terrified and it's something that has really, really affected them one way or the other. I don't think those people are making up those stories to keep people away from an area. Like the Kecksburg incident wasn't made up to keep business away from Kecksburg. You know, uh, people say with like Roswell or same with uh, the Pacific Northwest. Those people aren't generally making up Bigfoot stories to keep people away. If anything, with uh, Roswell, it has helped uh, boom to business and little plastic. Yeah, and, but, but, but also that could be an impetus as well. People could make up stories and create folklore to drive business, to drive some sort of cultural change, some sort of narrative that could be beneficial to people. When you um, said earlier, when people say, why would somebody say, why would somebody make up a story like that? Well, that just is just a, a terrible lack of creativity, of imagination. I, mm-hmm. I could make up a terrible story or a great story for all sorts of reasons. I might just not have anything better to do. Or I might have just had a silly idea come into my mm-hmm. head, and I'm, you know, I also think that there's something to be told about the more, and this almost comes back to how language creates reality. 
if we've lied once about being somewhere in a story, if we inject ourselves into a mm -hmm. story that we actually had very little to do with, the more we tell it, the more we kind of convince ourselves that we are part of it. You take some ownership kind of over it. The yeah. Laura Ingalls Wilder effect. Because mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, boy, she 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 spun some yarns, <laughs> but very good at it. <laughs> well, no, but it's true. But even I was watching. I was watching. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I was watching a documentary the other day. The other day, on uh, you know the DiCaprio movie Catch Catch Me If You Can. Mm -hmm. You know how it's based off like a true story. Apparently, according to this documentary, at least the vast majority of the stuff that that guy says that he did, he either certainly didn't do or was greatly exaggerated. It's like Bloodsport. You remember yeah. Bloodsport with Jean-Claude Gosh Darn? Oh, how, how could I forget? I loved that movie as a kid, okay? Yeah. And I believed it. Mm -hmm. And now, like, so many movies of my youth, I go back and I watch them, like, wow, this is really cheesy. And um, Bloodsport's one of them. I still like it. But it was the, the supposed story of Frank Dukes. And anybody that's ever heard of, like, fake martial artists, Frank Dukes is kind of the poster boy, yeah. the fake martial artist. And that entire thing is so much nonsense. But, mm -hmm. look, that guy it made a good living off of his nonsense. And there are more than enough people, grown people, that are willing to believe in it. And I think it, mm -hmm. part of it isn't... So much a center for attention sort of thing that you alluded to earlier. I think a lot of it is we want to in we if we, we want to be, we want to be part of the story the circle of things yeah. exactly we, we, we be part of the story ourselves we want to make whatever tangential connection we have to a thing a little closer to that and I think we do it for a great number of reasons. I don't think I think they're all very understandable. No, and that's the thing is, and I and I, I completely agree with what you said earlier about like when people are unwilling to question it, it's a lack of imagination. But I think again, it's also a lack of accepting the the less savory parts of reality. You know, again, I think we're talking about a very very wide spectrum here: fake martial arts versus someone having a cryptid sighting. Very very different. You know, in the sense of people wanting to inject themselves if they are making stuff up. But again, I, th I think that that is in vast, I think that is not as, I think it's a bigger deal than what some people think. And I think it's a much smaller portion than what other people think. Uh, I think the number is actually a lot more fluid and a lot, uh, a lot different than what it, what we, what some of us might think it is. Yeah. I guess when we, when we stretch truths and we tell and retell them, they be, we kind of run away with it and they become more real to us yeah. and you know things what never have happened uh, like we know just how fragile our memories really are and how absolutely um, you know they're they're susceptible to influence and that can be the influence of our own desire to again want to be a part of something absolutely and that's why i think whenever i hear stories whenever people hear, hear people telling you know any kind of fantastical story whether paranormal or not um like i tend to fall on the side of at first, at, at the very least, giving them the time, hearing them out, entertaining it, and at its base, believing people. Because even if, let's say statistically, you know, let's make up a number, one out of every 10 stories is completely fabricated. I, I can't remember if it was, and Mike, you might be able to correct me on this, I can't remember if this, if this is like a Tim Renner quote or if this is a, if this is a uh, quote from uh, Where the Road Go, but I'd rather believe... I'd rather believe everybody than not believe someone who is telling the truth. It's kind of a, a, yeah. a kind I think of, I've heard Tim Renner say that before. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of a, a deviation from I'd rather set ten criminals free than punish someone unduly yeah. once. You know, it's kind of the inverse of that, I guess. Uh, but that's kind of how I look at a lot of these stories. But you have to consider that whenever you're whenever you're looking at the a body of work as a whole, in this case, folklore. <laughs> you know, right. So it's something it's something you have to you have to at least uh give some time to and keep it as an open possibility at least. And that's why again, Nick, I'm glad whenever you mentioned that story initially, you were like, number one, it's completely just made up. Never happened, not real, <laughs> not a thing. Now here's the interesting parts. Let's and that's and that's why we talk, I think that's why we talk about this stuff and why these stories keep going is because you know, a lot of times from a cultural standpoint, like I said, there's other grains of truth, even if, let's say, even if it was made up, you know, like the Slender Man stuff, 
things eventually take on a life of their own and it gets so far removed from the fact of almost it doesn't matter as much what originally happened because the story has now grown into its own thing. And I just think I just think those are elements of storytelling, folklore, the paranormal, whatever, that we always need to make sure we're giving due due credence to. Slender Man was just such, such a crazy story. I mean, whenever those two young girls killed those their friend, tragic, I mean, yeah. it's insane. And, and, and not only that, but it they gives it a whole... They nearly did, yeah. And it yeah. gives it a whole new audience, because I had I'd never heard of the Slender Man before that. And I, mean, I guess it was an internet phenomenon, but mm-hmm. then it brings it into the mainstream media, and then it really takes off. Yeah. And it's one of the ones that really, um, I know, bugs certain people, is like some of the ones that are newer that, again sometimes get debunked even mm-hmm. but by the time they get debunked like like again you can't you can't unring a bell you can't unshoot a bullet like once it's gone and out there into the world it's 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 out there well i think um, if anything start as jokes just yeah I think some a lot of the anti-science sentiment that's out there and the anti mm-hmm. memes start as jokes that get carried way out and i think that is the one as the jokester sort of uh culture jamming sort of part of me that i enjoy that's one of the things i like about the internet because um these are terrible things that are being done like yeah. the whole flat earth thing is uh a really but are the people that are buying into that what else would they have bought into if they if they weren't going all in on that you yeah. know what i mean yeah no exactly like uh i remember speaking of speaking of flat earth i remember in college someone bringing that up and i think i remember one of my professors saying that was that was often used in argumentative practice because a lot of times when for those of you who weren't philosophy majors one of the things you have to do a lot is you have to argue for something that either is factually not true or that you in that you don't even believe like that's how you get good at picking hmm. out premises and really backing things up and, and staying away from fallacies is to argue like why the earth is flat, you know, the dialogue, and, as you say. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then you hear, I remember hearing years later that like, Oh, people actually think the world's flat. That's like, man, like we know so few things, but like, that's one of them, <laughs> you know, like, there's, like, like everything else, like we, yeah, we're not sure how gravity works. We know it's a thing. We're not sure how it works. We kind of have an idea of how the space-time structure works, but like we know the planet's round. Yeah, I have to tell you a quick thing. My just, uh, sir, my yeah. brother and sister-in-law have a neighbor who once said, "Well, and this is I believe this. This is not something they read somewhere. Their neighbor said this to them, and he honestly said, "Look, Mike, if Earth's round, then wire maps printed the way they are." Oh my God. And like Mike at the time, my brother-in-law didn't think to say, you know, they also make globes. Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the first, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You know, yeah, but it's just lack of. Oh God. I'll even, yeah, I don't want to get. I, it. I yeah. feel like I feel like the whole. Oh. I feel like the whole flat Earth thing. It, it all comes kind of back around to which we're not going to get into. Obviously, is the whole you know a big a big political thing. I mean, there's so many things tied into this thing of this misinformation. <laughs> You yeah, know, and and people yeah. with distrust for the government and distrust for science, science. So I mean, it's it's a whole it's a yeah. whole different animal. Yeah. For sure. I, I agree. I I distrust I distrust all institutions greatly, but I still think like there's just <laughs> come on. I, yeah, I, exactly. I'm particularly yeah. disappointed when if I know one political thing that you believe in or one stance that I can probably pretty accurately guess how you feel about 10 other things. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, I think that's problematic. I think that shows again, a lack of imagination, lack of imagination. Creativity yeah. and a lack of like weighing, what do you really believe in? I think a big problem is people try to care about everything and you can't like, mm-hmm. I'm trying to have fewer opinions. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. That's you know what I mean. <laughs> don't think about everything. I you can't imagine that. Informed about everything. Yeah. You can't be informed about everything. So what? It's like my being here. It's I'm trying to hear things out, and I'm trying to parse through them, and I'm trying not to be influenced by a charisma or mm. how old a thing is, but like really trying to see like. Does this conform to how I understand the way people think? Does this conform to the way I've come to understand through mm-hmm. words and experience the way 
my reality works and i'm trying to be really honest in all these things and again when yeah when people believe one thing and i can accurately guess how they feel yeah. about other things like yeah boy you're hardly a person at all yeah it's like you really haven't thought about this a whole lot no. but hey th that's actually a really good transition nick because i'm actually going to challenge you on something now this is actually this is, well this is this is something that kind of all three of us uh Ooh. agreed on uh this is kind of a uh a, a throwback to a few episodes ago i'm gonna blame um, nick yeah, no, but this is something that all three of us. I blame myself because I probably convinced you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is something that all three of us were kind of like, "What's the deal?" You know, I I think that that I came across a very reason, at least a reasonable answer. Um, all right, let's let's hear this. So, uh, so uh, shout out to my to my brother. He's the one who uh, who brought this up. Hey, Brian. And uh, well, he, he actually he actually brought up, brought up two things. We might end we might end on the second thing, but okay. the first more poignant thing. He was partaking in a ghost show. You know the uh, some of the shows a lot of us watch. I'm not gonna say which one, but it's one of the one of the one of the more well known ones. This wasn't like just a random YouTube video. This is something that was on major network television. For what that's worth, whenever they started doing an investigation, they turned all the lights off. And that's something we were, we were just talking about recently. And the host, who is a pretty well-established ghost hunter, uh, turned to the camera and said, you might be wondering why we turn the lights off whenever we conduct these investigations. And the reason that this person gave was that whenever the lights are off, it is easier to see two things. It's easier to see any kind of light anomaly that's that, that's taking place, whether they be orbs, flashes, anything along that that line. And two, because if there is no light sources, then whenever they do see a potential shadow figure or movement, they know it is not being created by a light source in the room. It is in theory something that is already there. So before you guys tear me apart for this, I thought those were two very reasonable excuses to turn off the lights while ghost hunting okay. reasonable but i still don't accept it like i yeah it's it's if i if somebody if we were in that rhetoric class and that was somebody's counter argument i would accept it as being reasonable but not valid because you know in a well-lit room you get fewer shadows i feel like than you do when you get like a single light source like you do with a camera i i don't know I also think like the whole orb thing is so much nonsense. I don't think any of us have ever seen a single incident of that. I also think, and Brendan, you know much more about camera. Well, both of you know a lot more about cameras and lenses. Um, how 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 much are they impaired in darkness to uh, focus in? So on so whenever whenever um, so so again, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, Nick. Especially with the whole like orbs are kind of. Eh thing but when it comes to the shadows uh whenever whenever you see those folks either in black and white or green um that is ir light coming from coming from ir uh mounted uh lights on the cameras so they so when they're in the dark like that they are actually in the dark <laughs> There is no visible light sources when they're doing these things. Um, so any shadows they see would not be created from IR light sources, gotcha. obviously. So I understand what you're saying. <laughs> like if if like if you have like uh, if you turn all the lights off and then put a regular like incandescent or LED light on a camera and we're shooting with regular visible light, I completely agree. That would be that would that that, that would that would then be cameras. that would that would then be uh, unsound and uh, unvalid. So to, to I am super that. appreciative that they addressed it though, Mike. What uh -oh. do you? Think? Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Mike? I mean, as, as for the light anomaly part, or the, the easier to see the the light orbs or whatever, I don't, I don't have any concern. I, I don't worry too much about the the light anomalies. I guess it never really has interested me too much. But when when they're talking about the the shadows and how it's easier to, to debunk where a, a shadow might have come from if you have the lights off i don't agree with that because okay so you're saying that the lights that they have on their cameras you can't see those at all correct that's ir light it's not okay. visible light it's picked up by the cameras which are specifically made to, to pick up ir yeah 
but I'm wondering like how would they perceive a shadow? Like say say the say that somebody walked in front of in front of the green light that was reflecting off of a mirror, could that still produce a shadow on a wall? Do you no. think? No. Okay. No, like I mean like in the sense that like um so like uh like in that case the camera would see it, but the person there would not see it. Right, the person wouldn't see it, but the camera could pick it up. Yes, yeah. So it, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, because it's still, a, a it's still it still is it still is light. So um, but I think what this person was saying is, and I think this is I think this is I think I'm kind of splitting hairs here trying to defend something that I didn't even <laughs> see. It's but okay. that's just the, again, this is where we're at. Um this is the uh, hill you chose to die on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, because I because I thought it was reasonable. I, I thought, like this is like this answers that Definitely question reasonable. for me, because I think they're operating under the assumption that I mean we hear this all we hear it a lot that when people say they see shadow figures, especially that um they're darker than dark, blacker than black. Um, right, but a camera and, can't pick up only so so much range of blackness. Correct. And I think that it is not for the camera's benefit necessarily, but for the investigator's benefit. Right. That's true. So that's that again, this is a, just, I'm kind of arguing for arguing sake now, but that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I interpret it and mm-hmm. why I, I still think a lot of our other previous criticisms about like EMF and all those things, I still think are absolutely valid arguments against it. Um, but again, I thought, and I thought this was this was reasonable. And like and like Nick said, I'm glad they at least addressed it because that means because that means at least other people are talking about it, you know, right. at yeah. least. So I mean, we're on to something there. I mean, one 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 there. argument I have, you know, you, you could say that the that they would rather have it dark and use the IR light or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like say you have your, you know, you have the lights on the like the ceiling lights, those are stationary lights. There's not a lot of things moving around. I really think it's kind of a cop out to say that uh that you wouldn't know that in this one room that has one ball in the ceiling where a shadow is coming from because it wouldn't be moving at all. No, you know you're right. You're right. And I, I I think it's I think it's just a matter of removing all possible light sources so that any shadows that are that are present are in theory paranormal. Right. I think that's it probably just, what it just seems to because me you're like, right. You're right. Like if you have you if you have one light source and that's a it's at a known fixed location in a camera at another known fixed location, you should be able to relatively easy, easily discern where any shadows right. are then coming from. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So there was, you said there was a second thing. Oh, the second thing, which is uh, possibly more important was uh, whenever we were talking about ghost hunting, we made, I think, I, th- I think it was Mike, but it might've been all of us. We, we made a quick list of like the five things that you're always going to bring on a right. ghost hunt. We you mentioned all those kind of things. Ghost. Yeah. Nick made me make a list. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, and Brian pointed out very dutifully that we did not include snacks on that list. And that absolutely <laughs> would be in the top five. That is incredibly important because I think, especially if you're going to an older haunt, let's say Victorian age, because that's, mm-hmm. you know, so it's a popular haunting time. Mm-hmm. Like you should probably bring period correct snacks if you yes. were to, try to use them as ghost bait. <laughs> yeah. You, you wouldn't walk in with uh, some newfangled take five. No, you would you would, you you might come in with some Nico wafers. The coffee break hadn't even been invented yet for people to understand what Take Five was referencing. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. see, I would I would take a different approach. I think I would rather be hungry. That way, whenever I'm yelling at the, the ghosts to show themselves, <laughs> I'd be especially irritable. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, people rag on New England confectionaries, but I love a uh, nothing like a. Chalky Necco wafer on a hot day. Yeah. Oh my god, I like them. I'm, I'm <laughs> joking. Like, no, I know. No, I know. Just, well, you can have all mine. Yeah, people yeah. were digging on those during the Civil War. Even I think. I think they go back to. They go back a time. Yeah, that, that was that was, used to be a treat for a lot of. Yeah, time. we'll have to find out and answer that and answer this and all your other <laughs> questions on our next exciting. <laughs> <episode>. <laughs> So we're done talking to each other for the night, but if you want to talk to us, Mike, how do people talk to us? Um, they can reach us at the Ghost Furnace Podcast at gmail.com. There you go. There we go. Fade awesome. out. Fade out. Fade out.